If I could please have your attention, we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Johnny Burtka. I'm the president of ISI and the publisher of Modern Age. Uh, and it's a privilege to welcome you to what I see really as a Modern Age launch party. Uh, Dan's been the editor of Modern Age for, for some time now, but he recently came on board full-time to ISI uh, this past week as the vice president of the Collegiate Network and editor-in-chief of Modern Age. And we have big plans to build a new website for Modern Age which with daily content. And I'll let Dan talk a little bit more about his vision for the online publication. But before we get started, I wanted to say a word about the history of Modern Age. Modern Age, as many of you know, was founded by Russell Kirk in 1957, but he actually began laying the groundwork for Modern Age six years earlier in 1951. Uh, he was shopping around a prospectus for the publication, and in the prospectus, he was describing his target audience, and there were really uh, four or five categories. He said he wanted uh, professors to read the journal, clergymen, men of business, men in government, and then the last category, which sort of overshadowed them all, was quote, reflective people in obscure walks of life who preserve the equilibrium in society. Reflective people in obscure walks of life who preserve the equilibrium in society. So looking out at the room right now, kind of putting you into categories, couple professors, maybe some, some businessmen here, probably no Biden administration officials. I can assume the only people who could make a panel on 2 p.m. on a Friday afternoon are reflective people from obscure walks of life. So thank you. <laughs> You uphold the equilibrium in our society. Uh, so the disposition of modern age that Kirk really envisioned was a publication that was national, even international in scope. It would talk about American conservatism, but it would also bring to bear pers perspectives from European conservatism. Uh, and he was also um, adamant that the publication had to have a Middle Western sensibility. He was concerned about the, uh, the elitism in some of the other journals. And uh, I think it's fitting that the, the publication ended up finding a home at ISI because our charter forbids us from ever being located in New York, Boston, or DC. And I think Dan McCarthy is the perfect man to maintain that original ethos that Russell Kirk set out to achieve. So without further ado, Dan McCarthy. Well, thank you very much, Johnny. <clears throat> The uh, equilibrium to which uh, Johnny alluded has, of course, been greatly disrupted in our country in uh, recent times. And uh, for that matter, you have seen a revisionist attempt to rewrite the nation's own origins. And uh, the 1619 Project, sponsored by the New York Times, has cast our country's origins in the most unfavorable possible of lights. It has uh, said that America is a country really founded upon slavery, and the whole point of taking 1619 as the point of departure is precisely that, to emphasize that slavery is not just you know, a, a, uh, a tragic and uh, a stain upon our, our history, but in fact is the essence of our history and uh, that it is the sine qua non of our entire republic. This cuts against you know, everything that Americans had believed about themselves up until this time. You saw in the last administration with President uh, Donald Trump, the 1776 commission was put together as an answer to the 1619 project, as a way to restore our faith in our founding virtues and founding principles. And yet, uh, the 1776 commission itself is not without controversy, uh, including among conservatives. And questions about the very nature of our republic and the foundations upon which it is built, whether they are philosophical and perhaps rather abstract, or whether they are traditional and historical and legal, these have continued to be battles, uh, questions that have been fought out by conservatives, uh, some of whom, uh, as disciples of perhaps someone like Harry Jaffa, have had one perspective, while uh, people who might be called paleoconservatives have often had a, a radically different view that is focused more perhaps on states' rights and upon traditions inherited from our uh, you know, sort of English uh, constitutional elements. We also have had these fundamental questions about whether America is an open society or not. And today on the right, you find libertarians who wish to defend uh, the idea that America is and ought to be an open society, while others, especially on the young right or the new right, say that either America is not and ought not to be such an open society, or that perhaps if it is an open society, that is a problem, and that is something that is going to undermine the moral foundations of the freedoms that we enjoy. So we have today a panel of four of the uh, sort of most outstanding intellectuals who represent several of these points of view 
on the American right. And in bringing them together, we reflect the mission of modern age to have a you know, sort of incisive conversation about where our country is going, where our world is going, and where conservatism and the right are going. This is something that we've tried to represent from the very beginning with Russell Kirk on through to today, uh, where I'm very honored to be the editor of this publication. So that's enough, I think, by way of introduction. We're gonna kick off the conversation. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our panelists right fast, and then we will uh, dive into these questions about the nature of America, uh, the nature of our founding, and how you know, our country's origins uh, affect the way in which we approach the controversies of today. So immediately to my right is Michael Anton, who is the author most recently of The Stakes. He's also very well known for his essay, The Flight 93 Election. He is a lecturer in politics at Hillsdale College's Kirby campus right here in Washington, DC, as well as a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute. And uh, he has extensive experience in politics and government, including uh, serving on the National Security Council uh, with President Trump. To his right, is Kevin Gutzman, who is professor of history at Western Connecticut State University. Professor Gutzman is the author of many books, including The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution, uh, James Madison and the Making of America, and Thomas Jefferson, Revolutionary, his most recent book published in 2017. To my far left, uh, only by position and not necessarily by <laughs> politics, is uh, Stephanie Slade. She is the managing editor of Reason Magazine, the libertarian magazine of free minds and free markets. Uh, she is also a recent uh, Robert Novak Journalism Fellow at the Fund for American Studies. And she has been a contributor to many publications, including America, uh, the Jesuit uh, magazine. Immediately to my left is Michael Knowles, who is the author of the best-selling uh, book, Speechless. Uh, he is also uh, the uh, host of several uh, key podcasts right now. I think Michael is probably the leading voice for the young new right uh, in America today. He has, of course, his own uh, program, The Michael Knowles Show. He's also the co-host with Ted Cruz of a podcast called The Verdict. So I think we'll begin by turning to Michael Anton to tell us a little bit about um, why you'd defend the 1776 Commission uh, against its critics from the right as well as from the left. Do you want to get up or just stay here? Oh, stay here by all uh, means. Oh, okay. Um, first, I just I wanted to thank Dan for being here. It's a kind of a culmination of a project that I've personally uh, been working on for a while, which I, you know, a reconciliation, if you will, between certain parts of the right, um, and a, a rift which has been contributed to, I would have to say, by some institutions with which I am affiliated and teachers with whom I have had. But I will get into that for a moment. I do just want to mention off of the top that uh, I know Michael Knowles. I've done his show before. I know Professor Gutzman by reputation, but I've never met him before. I didn't know Stephanie. And so when Dan told me who was going to be doing this, I, of course, do what you do. You Google and you go on Twitter. And one of the first things I found on Twitter was, uh, if, I, if I recall this correctly, her calling me a Nazi. Um, now, she also called J.D. Or sorry, JD Vance a Nazi in the same post, so I thought, I'm in good company. But it shows you how broad-minded the right is getting. People like Stephanie are willing to share the stage with a Nazi, so-called, and even shook my hand uh, before this started. Anyway, going back. I was a student of Harry Jaffa, who's a big driver of some of these controversies, because he picked gigantic fights with uh, especially Wilmore Kendall and uh, Mel Bradford. In the, but this is, we have to go back to the 60s and 70s. And Jaffa was defending a pretty strictly, I would say, literal interpretation of the Declaration of Independence and the principles inherent in the Declaration of Independence. Um, I don't want to claim to speak for Jaffa today. If he were here, he died five years ago now, he may be, he might, might be in exactly the same sort of frame of mind as he was in, say, 1975, uh, and deny that there's any value or validity to the paleoconservative um, argument in favor of tradition and organic growth of a, of a culture and a society, and he might also, to you know, state his position on the sort of, if we take Michael here as representing the Catholic position, um, a, a kind of extreme take on the separation of church and state, he might. I would just say that in my own thinking and the thinking of people around me in the circles that I, you know, the, the pools that I swim in, uh, Hillsdale, Claremont, and so on, um, my other teachers and friends have kind of come to see, uh, especially as the crisis of America and the crisis of the West deepens, so much more commonality with these two positions than appeared in the great, you know, Jaffa Bradford debates of the 60s and 70s that you know, we've been trying to build bridges, if you were. And for myself, I would say that the arguments that I've been making 
Um, I don't think disagree or depart from the letter of Jaffa's teaching at all. I think you can believe what Jaffa, what I learned from Jaffa, and still see the value of the paleoconservative position, both as a practical matter, certainly on trade, on foreign intervention, and on immigration. The paleos were right in the mid-90s, and the mainstream Republican Party was wrong in the mid-90s, right? There's no question about that. But even at a deeper philosophical level, and the same thing with the sort of more Catholic or religious-based position. So I've been trying to demonstrate that um, in, in what I've been writing lately. I, Dan brought up the 1776 Commission, which was populated by a lot of my friends and colleagues and so on, and um, an attack was mounted on it that I thought was imprudent and not helpful. That I, I didn't mean to try, and I don't think that I did, try to defend the 1776 Commission as flawless or um, um, you know, without any kind of blemish or without any kind of mistake or lack of emphasis or overemphasis on, on the wrong thing or something. But I thought that as an antidote to the 1619 project, it was very effective, and I, I thought that it was an extraordinary thing for the, I mean, imagine this. You know, we all know what the federal government is like right now, don't we? The President of the United States himself convened this commission to write a patriotic report that says that America was good. Right? So it seems to me that there, there's a massive benefit of the doubt has to be given to it just from that um, right off the bat, given the cultural climate we were in in the middle of 2020 with the George Floyd riots and the, it seemed like uh, a concerted attack on everything fundamentally American by every power center in our society. And then, then and that, you know, uh, it sounds like I'm damning the thing with faint praise, but actually if you dig into it, its account of the principles that, that motivated the founding and so on, I think was, was basically accurate and deserved widespread support. And I will note, though, uh, that so far, you know, these efforts at building bridges and shaking hands and dialogue and talking to one another, I think, have borne fruit. My presence here, I like to think, is um, evidence of that. Um, you know, I've gotten, I've had very productive exchanges with somebody like Paul Gottfried. It was impossible to imagine Paul Gottfried and anybody from my side of the aisle like speaking candidly and civilly and learning from one another even 20 years ago, and it's happening now. You know, the Chronicles reviewed my book favorably. Um, yeah, I, I could, the, the guys at the American Conservative reached out and wanted to, you know, cross-pollinate more with us. So with a handful of exceptions, which I sometimes liken to, you know, the proverbial Japanese soldier on an island in 1950 who doesn't know or doesn't want to admit that the war is over. Uh, I think this is, this is bearing fruit, and, and, and what I want to see happen, I'm hoping, is happening. That is to say, since we almost entirely agree on the nature of 2021 and the future, um, you know, we need to move forward, or it would be better if we move forward on a sound basis, while not papering over or denying whatever theoretical differences remain, but also trying to see that some of those theoretical differences might have been uh, over sharpened or over emphasized in the past, and we might have, even our theory, well, certainly our practical policy positions, but maybe even our theoretical positions are a little closer in hindsight than they appeared when some of these great debates started. That's at any rate my position, speaking only for myself, but I know that many of my friends and colleagues agree with me. I will just end by saying, repeating, if, if we could bring Jaffa here himself, and, and Jaffa was a sort of a cranky, ornery guy who liked to fight. Um, and very rarely liked to admit that he'd ever gotten anything wrong, although he did occasionally. It was rare. I can't speak for him, but I think I can speak for most of the rest of my friends at Hillsdale and the Claremont Institute to say that we're all kind of in the same place on this now. The debates among uh, conservatives can become quite high voltage. I seem to recall at one point, uh, Harry Jaffa, in writing about uh, Wilmore Kendall, also said that you know at the bottom of his ideas, you know you had such a uh, relativism that it could easily lend itself to a kind of American Nazism or an American cannibalism. So uh, these uh, sorts of uh, inflammatory terms have often been thrown out. And uh, uh, you know, thank you for uh, you know sort of. Uh, bringing forward the need to uh, be civil and to reconcile our ideas and to you know, really engage with them as opposed to simply using One use very them. short point before we move on. I just want to emphasize how much Jaffa respected and loved Kendall and Bradford. These were acrimonious, high-stakes debates, but they, they weren't bitter and they weren't personal. And in fact, while most of them took place in print, I and mean, this is one of these sort of forgotten lore questions, but it's a little bit of gossip. He used to speak to them on the phone frequently for hours and hours and hours at a time mm -hmm. because he had such great respect and admiration for them. And in fact, um, you know, this is a long forgotten conservative controversy, but uh, in the early Reagan administration, the question of who was going to take over the National Endowment from the Humanities came up, and Bradford was appointed, and uh, a, a certain quarter of the right put up a hue and cry, and it became a gigantic fight. And in the end, 
Bradford was not appointed and Bill Bennett was appointed, nothing against Bill Bennett, whom I also love. Uh, and I was t 11 years old at the time, so I had nothing to do with this controversy. But Jaffa supported Bradford. Just know that. That's right. The reason these uh, terms get thrown about is not uh, for the reasons that you find on the American left, where these labels are meant to uh, you know, be uh, the end of the conversation. It's rather that uh, conservatives, in looking at the sort of deep philosophical sources of, of their fellow conservatives, have sometimes been afraid that there is too much relativism or even something that might be a kind of values nihilism or a principles nihilism which can then lend itself to things that conservatives would never willingly embrace, like cannibalism, for example. But I think this leads to uh, perhaps a, a good question for Professor Gutzman. Um, tell us about uh, your thoughts on the limitations of the Harry Jaffa approach to uh, the American founding. What's wrong with uh, sort of Jaffa's idea that uh, certain abstract natural rights are the sort of uh, the core and the defining element uh, from the Declaration, which then uh, provides for all of, uh, you know, the way in which we should interpret all of our uh, political experience. Well, thank you, Dan. I'm not a cranky old guy who likes to fight, and so <laughs> here I am next to Mr. Anton answering that question. Uh, actually, what I'd like to do is to lay out the way that I understand the establishment of the United States, and uh, perhaps at the end of that brief comment, I'll say something about the way that I would distinguish that from the Jaffite or Hillsdale, uh, Claremont uh, understanding of these things. Um, so on May 15, 1776, the Virginia Convention, which was Virginia's ruling body after Lord Dunmore, the last royal governor, had fled, adopted three resolutions. Virginia needed, it decided, a Declaration of Rights, a Republican Constitution, and federal and treaty relations. That next couple of days saw the publication in Williamsburg in the local newspaper of a story that said that Virginia had declared its independence on May 15, 1776. In fact, the night of this event, the youngest member of Virginia's convention 25-year-old James Madison wrote to a friend and said, we have today declared our independence. This, uh, I think, is entirely in keeping with the way that an absent Virginian who would rather have been in Williamsburg at the time, Congressman Thomas Jefferson understood what was going on in Williamsburg in May of 1776. He, in fact, repeatedly had written home to people who were in the convention asking them pleased to relieve him of his congressional duties because, he said, uh, the entire uh, stake of the revolution is being decided in Williamsburg now. If we adopt a bad constitution of our own device, it would have been wiser to have accepted the bad one that is on offer from across the water without the expense of the contest. So uh, the point of that is that it was a kind of consolation prize for him to be the chief draftsman of the Declaration of American Independence. And in fact, the way that he referred to that uh, as soon as he was finished with it in his correspondence was as, uh, well, by saying, we have today adopted a, a declaration uh, of independence in the form of uh, my political principles, uh, et cetera. So, uh, I think that the primacy that all of these events I've just described gave to this, the status of Virginia in the imperial system and the status of Virginia in geostrategic terms shows the way that I understand the federal constitution today. And since I first wrote about this 25 years ago, there's come to be a body of scholarship showing that it wasn't only Virginians who thought of creating an American federal union in geostrategic terms. That is, uh, it wasn't only they who thought that what we're doing here is we're, we're going to have to have alliances among these North American quondam colonies because otherwise we'll be unable to defend ourselves from Europeans and we'll be unable to uh, resist the impulse to fight with each other. So I think that what came first were these state identities in fact, we know that in Virginia, at least as late as the 1829-30 Constitutional Convention, they were still saying in, in the Constitutional Convention, leading figures, and this is a body in which Monroe, Madison, Marshall all participated, uh, 
that May 15, 1776 was the day that Virginia had established its independence. Um, what does this tell us about America today, you might be thinking? And the answer is, well, it, ref it, it affects the way that you understand America's current federal constitutional system. So if you start with the question, well, how exactly is it that Congress, how exactly is it that the federal executive, how exactly is it that anybody beyond our state legislature came to have this authority over us? I think the answer to that question is pretty easy to reach. So um, my reading of these things is that the federal relationship that the people who made the revolution thought they were establishing by fighting that war was far preferable to the national leviathan we have now. And it's for this that I stand. I think uh, as a matter of political philosophy, if you have a decentralized government, what Jefferson preferred was a decentralized government. He said at one point, I prefer the states over the federal government, but within the states, I prefer the counties over the states, and then I prefer what he called wards, what we would call precinct over the, precincts over the counties. And why would you want to have that? The answer, of course, is that the average person can't have any effect on her federal government. She can't have any real effect on her state government. But if most of the matters that are going to uh, intrude on her life day to day are determined at a local level, then she can have an influence. She can actually be involved in shaping her own life. And it's for this reason I think that's important we remember what the shape of our regime was intended to be, even if it may be a forlorn hope now, we can still insist on it. So that's the message I'd like to leave with you. Thank you, Kevin. So I think uh, one of the key questions regarding states' rights and also individual rights is uh, whether um, you are going to have uh, a variety of community standards which are going to determine uh, the limits of freedom within the states and then perhaps as the states aggregate into a union within the union as a whole, or whether there needs to be a recurrence to the natural rights of the individual, which should set the limits on the local community as well as on uh, the union. So I want to turn to Stephanie Slade and to ask her, uh, well, first of all, um, she'll have an opportunity to address uh, the ways in which uh, she has written about perhaps uh, J.D. Vance and, uh, and uh, Michael Anton here, but also uh, more fundamentally, what, you know, is America an open society? Is liberty the sort of core of our, um, our tradition and our, you know, uh, our, our polity? Um, or is it the case that, um, and uh, you know, I, I know that you have concerns about what you may perceive as an authoritarian drift, perhaps, on the American right. Um, and what would your prescription be for addressing that and getting back to uh, you know, the understanding of the founding and of our polity that you have? Thanks, Dan. So the question is basically, um, you know, you're talking about openness, which is interesting. Another way that it's often presented is, you know, what was our founding all about? Is the government there to protect individual liberty, or is it there to promote virtue? Um, there are a lot of these sort of debates and, and discussions about the founding. Was the founding religious or secular? Um, was it a sort of uniquely glorious event, or was it you know, tainted by sin? Like, these are the kinds of questions that I think our country has been grappling with the last couple of years and, and have definitely be, been live on the right. Um, I'm kind of here, I think, to represent the, the fusionist position, and as a good fusionist, my answer, generally speaking, is going to be <coughs> To all of those questions, you know, pick pick any of them. The answer is all of the above. It's, you know, the founding was both religious and secular. The purpose of government is both, you know, the purpose of the of the American experiment is both to uh, promote virtue and the common good and the sort of traditional Judeo Christian values, um, and also to protect individual liberty. Freedom was a very important component of the founding. Um, and the purpose of, of this experiment that we are still sort of uh, getting to be participants in. So you go back and you listen to or you know, read the, the rhetoric and the writings of the founders, and you're going to find that they are replete with references to things like uh, liberty and individual liberty. I mean, it, one of my favorite quotes, actually, looking backwards, was H.G. Wells, who said, um, all Americans are, from the English point of view, liberals of one sort or another. Uh, liberalism, in, not in the sense of left of center, but in the sense of concern with protecting individual liberty, has always been at, at the core of sort of what it means to be an American and what the American system is all about. Um, 
Rich Lowry, in his book on nationalism, writes over and over again about the sort of bullheaded insistence on individualism and a desire to be left alone that was you know, manifest in the United States of America going back to like 1630. And I mention Rich Lowry because I have also been critical of him. I wrote a very critical review of his book. But I want to show that this is not just the libertarian perspective. This is a, a widely understood um, sort of understanding of what America is all about. But contra perhaps my libertarian friends and colleagues, it's not just, it was never just about liberty. Uh, virtue was always incredibly important as well. So right alongside all of the, all of the, um, uh, you know, celebration of uh, securing the blessings of liberty for posterity and that sort of stuff. You also get, um, you know, quotes like the famous John Adams, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people and is ho wholly inadequate to the uh, government of any other, right? Morality and virtue and religion, and these things were incredibly important. They were understood, I think, from the very beginning to be necessary um, components of the common good that, that this was all about trying to, trying to achieve. Um, Frank Meyer, who is often considered to be the godfather of fusionism, um, he was a, he's the late National Review senior editor, and he put it this way, the founders understood that freedom is meaningless unless founded upon the laws of nature and of nature's God. The protection of the free energies of free individuals so that they might in liberty strive to live according to those laws was there, the founders, most intimate concern. So you can see that it's both liberty and virtue. These, these, both these, these values just arise again, again, and again. And, and then you have interesting questions that I've done some writing about, um, about how, how can you have these two, two preeminent values? You know, they seem to pull against each other often. Um, and we can, we can come back to that. That's uh, certainly core of the, of the question. Frank Meyer's answer was that um, you should think in terms of two different spheres, the governmental sphere and the non-governmental sphere. And the government exists solely to protect the liberty of the individual, and we, in our individual and, and collective um, voluntary capacity, exist to pursue the higher things, to live, you know, to live virtuous lives, and to build communities, and to do these other things um, that have that go far beyond just being free to do whatever makes you feel good. Um, there is a thing um, that has been emerging on the right in the last couple of years that is concerning to me, that is that is disturbing to me, which is a sense that. We are under attack by the left. No, no, no disagreement from me here. Um, and therefore, and you know, they have no qualms about using the power of the state to try to destroy us and everything we believe in. And therefore, anything less than responding in kind would be unilateral disarmament um, and suicidal. Um, and that is the sort of rhetoric. It sort of leads has led a number of conservatives to talk in terms of um, not persuasion, um, not conversion, but seizing power and defeating and destroying the enemy. And the other side, not as you know, fellow human beings created in the image of God or fellow American citizens with the same rights as us, but as enemies, not just opponents, but enemies to be destroyed. I'm really bothered by this language. I think it leads to some ugly places. I did read an art, uh, write, uh, write an article a couple weeks ago about J.D. Vance um, in which I, I only called one person a Nazi, and that was the Nazi Carl Schmitt. Um, but, I, but I commented that there is a sort of embrace of the Schmittian outlook um, that I see. And in some cases, it's very, it's very explicit um, among conservatives that I, I think we ought to be aware of and be a little nervous about and, and probably re resistant to more than many, many young conservatives right now are. So I, I leave you with to sort of get back to the early, the early values of the founding and what we're supposed to be all about and how it ties back to that concern that I have and that nervousness that I feel uh, with Thomas Paine who said, he that would make his own liberty secure must guard even his enemy from oppression. For if he violates this duty, he establishes a precedent that will reach to himself. I think that we have a little bit lost sight of that. Um, certainly the left has. I, again, I'm not denying the, the threats that we face from the left. Um, but I think that if the response to they want to destroy us is we need to seize power and destroy them first, um, I, I, I'm going to have to be on the. I'm going to have to be against you on that one. The uh, balance between liberty and virtue is something that conservatives have tried to understand and to you know get correct. Uh, going back to the very founding of the post-war conservative movement, uh, Michael Knowles has just written a very insightful introduction to God and Man at Yale, which was the first book published by William F. Buckley Jr. And uh, the subtitle of God and Man at Yale is The Superstitions of Academic Freedom. Uh, 
And uh, as uh, Michael quite uh, rightly focuses on in his introduction, uh, Buckley is in fact uh, not arguing in favor of what we would call academic freedom. He's actually uh, quite critical, at least, of the way in which uh, a kind of open-ended academic freedom was being abused by uh, leftists um, at a campus like Yale University, which you know had uh, a Christian founding and which you know had long benefited from the capitalist system. Uh, progressives were saying, well, we, we just want academic freedom, we just want to have a diversity of views. Once they had established, however, uh, their own freedom to operate, what did they do? They proceed to close the door behind them and, and they proceed to say, well, now we actually are going to have an orthodoxy. We are going to not have free speech and academic freedom, but the new orthodoxy is going to be a left-wing one instead of a right-wing one. So Michael Knowles has been confronting this very issue uh, in his book, Speechless, and uh, indeed uh, in his work, uh, in his podcast, and in this uh, introduction to William F. Buckley Jr.'s God and Man at Yale. So Michael, tell us about uh, you know, this striking the right balance between liberty and order, and uh, how we should think about, uh, you know, is America uh, this natural rights, enlightenment, uh, open society, you know, which may have some element of virtue added to it, or is uh, that, found, that understanding, that enlightenment understanding of our country perhaps uh, far off base? Or if it is true, is it actually maybe a bad thing rather than a good thing? Well, uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you for the invitation here. I'm, I'm reminded we're talking about Buckley, and we're talking about people calling people Nazis, and we're talking about using force now and the threat of force. And it just makes me want to return to that halcyon era back you know, 70 years ago when Gore Vidal was calling Bill Buckley a Nazi and he called him a queer and threatened to punch him in the face. So you know, we don't want to. Uh, <laughs> plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Um, I, I think that the problem of the adequacy of the principles and the founding principles hinges less on the founding part than on the principles part. And I think that the principles part will help us to understand how to strike this balance and help us to put this into practice. Because I don't think that the principles or any other sort of principles are sufficient to reclaim a political order. I think you need practice for that and you need to put it into your body and it needs to be incarnational and enfleshed and uh, you need to actually do things. Uh, we, we focus a lot on these principles and what these principles mean and, and trying to divine what James Madison might have thought of this or Thomas Jefferson might have thought of that. We come up with all sorts of labels, many of which we've touched on today, the paleos and the neos and the libertarians and the traditionalists. I, a friend said once that the uh, obscure political monikers are the right-wing version of gender pronouns. You know, we, they are equally abundant and uh, usually equally uh, confusing. Uh, I myself, because of Dan's uh, wisdom, now call myself a McCarthyite. I think that's uh, where that would be my political view. Norman Podhoritz recently described himself as a paleo neoconservative because he's too old to be a neo neoconservative. <laughs> and uh, the the issue with all of these <laughs> labels, I think, and, and the the reason why I think that an obsession with principle to the exclusion and neglect of practice is that we get very confused about what those principles are when we abstract them out of time and space and try to make sense of them. So an erstwhile conservative columnist, who at the time, though, was really considered conservative and quite respected, a couple of years ago uh, described drag queen story hour as uh, one of the blessings of liberty, which I think would be a surprise to James Madison. Uh, you may hear him turning in his grave at the very suggestion that Drag Queen Story Hour is one of the blessings of liberty. And, and I can understand why one might think that, just reading those words on the paper. Well, I don't know, it's liberty. We now think of liberty as doing whatever you want to do. So maybe, yeah, sure, dressing up as a girl and tw twerking for a toddler, maybe that's liberty. Uh, but we know that it isn't. We know that if someone did this in the founding era, they would have been run out of town on a rail. We know that transvestitism was illegal in many parts of America for most of our country's history. We know that uh, sodomy was illegal at the time of the founding. In the 1770s in Virginia, the punishment for sodomy was death. The much more liberal-minded Thomas Jefferson uh, lobbied uh, the, the Virginia legislators to reduce this punishment to mere castration. He was so open-minded and so liberal. Uh, so I don't, I don't think drag queen story, I, I, I think the practice of, of how this actually was understood will tell us much more than the principle in the abstract. I think the same goes for freedom of religion. Freedom of religion now we take to mean that the government can't have anything to say about religion or religious matters. Uh, but we know that uh, one of the reasons that the, the framers decided not to establish a church at the federal level 
is because there were established churches at the state level, and they were funded by the states, and they persisted for decades and decades after uh, the Constitution. So that, that would seem to clarify things if we look at the actual practice. And, and certainly this is true for freedom of speech. We now have this idea that freedom of speech means you can say whatever you want whenever you want to say it. Free speech absolutism, many people will, will cry. Uh, this w idea, I think, would have been foreign to the founders, and it was certainly, founders, uh, cer certainly foreign to the people that the founders got their ideas from. John Locke, in the letter concerning toleration, said that we need to tolerate free speech from everybody, except for atheists. We should never tolerate atheists. They ought to be ostracized from society. John Milton, in Areopagitica, it's the most famous defense of free speech in the English language, he says we need to tolerate free speech for everybody, except for Catholics. And so I'm pleased, personally, that he, we've, we've gotten rid of that prohibition. Uh, but frankly, I understand why he put it in place, reading certain motu proprio from the Pope, maybe, and also because of the, the liberal, uh, the, because of the, the revolutions, because of the political order that uh, Milton was living through. The practice of it shows us what is, what is going on here. And I, the, the Catholic part of it all, Mike alluded to this earlier, you know, per, perhaps I'm representing more of a Catholic point of view here. Um, but the Catholics have played an outsized role in the history of American conservatism. Uh, you mentioned Frank Meyer even, the, was, Frank Meyer was a Catholic, James Burnham even, certainly Bill Buckley, Brent Bozell, Phyllis Schlafly, uh, the founder of our feast today, Russell Kirk, and the list goes on and on and on. What, why is this? Is this part of some conspiracy to uh, take power and overthrow the Constitution and make Adrian Vermeule the Holy Roman Emperor? <laughs> perhaps, perhaps, I'm not saying I'm opposed to it, but I, I don't think that's what it's about. I think it's because Catholicism uniquely is an incarnational faith. It, it, it really matters what you do. Uh, I, I fear that sometimes our obsession with principles and finding the right ism leads to a sort of political quietism where we think that that, that will solve our political problems. But the Catholic perspective is not, not that. The Catholic perspective is we actually have to do things. And I think the reason that the Catholic Church is the only institution that survived from antiquity into modernity uh, is, is because it's a real place with real people, with a real pope who has a real hat, you know, and we have to really do things and have real sacraments. So that perspective is not to say that uh, we need to, you know, abolish the Constitution and submit to Pontifex. Quite the opposite. I think what it's saying is that uh, we must really do things and uh, that free speech in the abstract, for instance, will not mean anything for people who don't have anything to say and that so much of our quibbling these days over procedural norms actually kind of misses the point if you're not talking about substantive goods. I think, uh, you know, all all polities have standards and taboos, and they all have some vision of the good, and they want to pursue good and avoid evil. And we can pretend that that's not the case, but perhaps that's why we're going to lose a lot of ground. And I think it is incumbent upon us, therefore, not merely to settle political questions, as we're going to try to work through today, but also to, to actually do it. You know, I, there, there are many friends of mine who are living in sterile apartments in perpetual adolescence, and they talk a good game on Burke's little platoons, but they don't actually do this sort of thing. And, and I just think uh, no matter what brilliant exegesis we have on some founding principle, uh, that will not matter unless we actually embody it and do it. Thank you. So if you've just come into the room, uh, feel free to come forward and take a seat. We do have a few open. Uh, let me turn to Michael Anton and ask you to um, Talk about the importance of principle in your understanding of our politics, because I know this has been a, a point of disagreement between yourself and some of the paleoconservatives. Um, they, uh, you know, you probably would agree with them that uh, principle is not sufficient by itself. You do need to have practical guidelines as well. But uh, I think you've raised the question of whether the paleoconservatives and perhaps others have been negligent in seeing the importance of principle and particularly the principles of the Declaration of Independence in providing a foundation for our practices. Yeah, I mean, the argument, that it, it's not really being used much anymore. This is one of the reasons I think that the distance between us is so much smaller. It used to be, well, if you follow the principles of the Declaration the way you Claremont guys want to, it inevitably leads to open borders and free trade and democracy wars and all of this stuff. I, we myself and Tom West and many others have put in countless thousands of hours trying to argue against that. I feel like we've finally gotten somewhere. <laughs> and so those arguments aren't being thrown at us as much anymore. So I, I just I will say I've heard very little to disagree with, if anything, to my right or, or to my left over here. Um, you know, 
Everything that I've heard, though, I can square, not only can I square easily with the principles of the founding as I understand them, I think the things that I'm hearing rest more firmly on a basis if they're on those principles than if they are said to be organic or historically contingent or culture-based or whatever. And that, incidentally, from everything I've read over and over again, is simply not the way the founders understood themselves. They did understand themselves to have discovered, or if not discovered, at least laid bare and explicated the true principles of political legitimacy that they were going to act on going forward. And the, ar the deepest argument of Jaffa is that gets insufficient attention, which, um, and partly that's Jaffa's fault in the way that he wrote. Um, he wrote lots and lots of articles everywhere, and he only wrote really two sort of systematic books, and he didn't spell this out fully in either one, um, or, or he didn't spell it out clearly and succinctly in either one. I, I will say, though, I will recommend a book of uh, another one of my colleagues named Glenn Elmer's that just came out from Encounter maybe last week called The Soul of Politics, kind of an intellectual biography of Jaffa, which he sums this up. And, and even though it's gauche to do so, I will do it. My own review of Glenn's book, uh, which is quite a bit shorter, in American Greatness, published maybe 10 days ago, we summarize this point. But Jaffa, the, the deepest strata of his argument is that something fundamental, many things fundamentally changed from the classical to the modern world, which made the classical solution for the foundation or basis of right political action impossible to port directly. It had to be changed and modified because of the Roman conquest of the ancient world, the destruction of the polis, the death of paganism, the emergence of Christianity, the sundering of civil and religious law, the breakup of Christianity into sex, the division in the soul between um, allegiance to a, 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 a terrestrial prince and to a, a supernatural god. All of these things make a new basis for political legitimacy necessary, and the founders um, building on the early moderns come up with that. One of the things that got Jaffa in the most trouble with his fellow Straussians, you know, Jaffa was a student, really Leo Strauss's very first student, and held in high regard by the Straussians for about 20 years until he started to break with them in saying America is not simply, um, this, I mean, and this is where Jaffa would agree with the, the paleos in a sense. The Eastern Strauss, you know, what he, what he would deride as the Eastern Straussians would say, America is just Locke made into a country, right? It's, it's a kind of a Deneen thesis in a way. It's just early modern liberalism, you read the book, how would I write a constitution based on this? I write the US Constitution, and it's all maximize liberty, maximize consumption, maximize personal enjoyment, uh, no virtue, no duties, or as Strauss puts it at the end of that famous chapter of national right in history, the joyless quest for joy. Jaffa fought that interpretation for the last at least 30 years of his life, uh, insisting, 40 even, <coughs> insisting that there was a classical element um, that the founders grappled, a classical and a religious element that the founders grappled with to try to um, you know, create a firm basis for political right. Uh, and he was, he was absolutely ridiculed by the Eastern Straussians for that and basically ignored by everyone else for this argument who just didn't pay any attention to it. So when we talk about when did the state of Virginia declare independence, I would say I, I, I completely, I know what you're talking about. It's absolutely right. The question that I then ask is, but on what basis? And this is where I do stand with Jaffa. The basis is not simply, I'm, I'm being glib here, and I don't mean that to be an insulting, but the basis is not simply because we want to. It was because this is the right thing to do. And, and it's the right thing to do because we have an understanding of human nature and eternal principle that demonstrates the justice of our actions. That's you know, the one sort of core bedrock of the teaching that I learned that I never stray from, because A, because I think it's right, but B, because I think it gives us the firmest possible basis to get all the things that, that we want, at least that is to say the paleoconservatives and the more traditional religious conservatives that we want. We want the promotion of virtue. We want both freedom of religion and the promotion of religion, because you're completely right. The founders were, you know, look, that line in the Northwest Ordinance, we're going to promote religion in these territories. We have no problem with established churches. We will use the law to um, 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 punish and criminalize certain things that we think are corrosive of society. All these things that a, a, a true Lockean liberalism or, or post-Lockean liberalism would find anathema, the founders had absolutely no problem with, not because they were kind of woolly-headed and didn't realize that these things were inconsistent with their principles, but what I learned from Jaffa and from his students is that because they were clear-eyed and they saw that these things were entirely consistent with their principles. And we, in the modern world, not we conservatives, but the modern world, which speaks in the name of the founders, a sort of neoliberal modern world, whatever you want to call it, I sometimes like to call it just the regime, you know, that says, well, you know, our democracy and uses these sort of catchphrases as if George Washington, Madison, Jefferson, I mean, the, the regime has sort of two minds about the founders. 
One is they were all slave-owning racists and we should destroy their statues and change it the name of every street that they're named after. And the other is that they're, uh, you know, there are great heroes, but of course they would completely support flying the LBGQ flag from every embassy in, in the world. And it's like, hmm, I don't know that I can square those two propositions, but whatever. Um, that, in, that sort of modern neoliberal interpretation of the founding is, is just, it's wrong. It's not true to what they believed, and I don't think it's true to the nature of things that they perceived. So I was going to uh, shake up the order of our responses, but actually I know that uh, Kevin Goodsman uh, has some thoughts uh, that he wants to um, uh, bring to the table right now, so please go ahead. Well, uh, hmm. a couple of years before the events I was talking about earlier in 1776, um, then unknown um, Burgess Thomas Jefferson uh, dashed off what he thought would be instructions for um, Virginia's delegates to the First Continental Congress. And he ended up coming down with an illness and it had to be taken to uh, Williamsburg for consideration by the legislature, uh, by one of his servants. But in that, uh, in that document, Jefferson argued essentially that Virginia was a freestanding society of its own. And that didn't mean that it had to be philosophically justified. It just existed. So he took for granted that it had positive attributes that he would defend, but he didn't think he had to defend them. And uh, if you're familiar with the Summary View of the Rights of British America, which is about 18 pages of impudence from this, who, who is this tobacco planter to King George, uh, you know that he essentially spends the entire space of that thing upbraiding the king for daring to interfere with internal operations of Virginia that aren't really any of his business constitutionally. Um, as to the Declaration of, in, of Virginia's Independence on May 15, 1776, I said before that the first of those three resolutions that the Virginians adopted said they needed to have a Declaration of Rights, which nowadays we think is the tail end of a constitution, but if you think about it, it's actually what is the basis of a constitution, so it should come first. When George Mason's committee reported out a draft a Declaration of Rights, section one said, um, that all men are born free and equal and government is responsible for protecting their rights. And the first thing that happened uh, when this was reported was that there came an objection from the colonial treasurer of Virginia, Robert Carter Nicholas, who said, well, if we say in our very first section of our Declaration of Rights that all men are born free and equal and government is responsible for protecting their rights, we're going to face a problem immediately either we can begin our Republican career by ignoring our own first stated principle, or we can immediately institute a social convulsion whose, whose repercussions we cannot name. So he said, I propose an amendment. The first article then, the first section then of Virginia's Declaration of Rights said, all men are born free and equal, and when they enter into a state of society, government is responsible for protecting their rights. Now, there were people in the room who thought that excluding slaves from the polity was the wrong, was philosophically mistaken. It was a wrong thing to do. And there were people there who had already argued against slavery. But they began by saying, we're not going to dispute, we're not going to argue about this. We're not going to have that discussion. So I think it's mistaken to say that the fundamental principle was human equality to occur. It wasn't. The, uh, I want to add a quick bibliographical footnote because we've had a couple of names of prominent historical conservatives mentioned, and I know that not everyone uh, watching this, not everyone in the audience today may be fully aware of them. So Frank Meyer was a longtime senior editor at National Review. He wrote a book called In Defense of Freedom, and Meyer was uh, seen as being the sort of uh, philosophical or ideological architect of the idea of fusionism, bringing together traditionalist and libertarian uh, elements on the right. And Frank Meyer never saw it as really uh, appropriate for the term fusionism. He didn't think these were opposite things that had to be uh, sort of uh, you know, forced together. He instead thought there was actually an organic connection that originally liberty and order had grown up together in the Middle Ages and in the early modern period, and then they became separated in the 19th century, and that this created a conflict which had split conservatism 
into opposing camps of those who emphasized liberty and those who emphasized virtue and order. The other name that's come up a few times is, of course, Harry Jaffa. And uh, I think uh, Michael just mentioned uh, Glenn Elmers' new biography of Harry Jaffa, which is now available from Encounter Books. Uh, Harry Jaffa is perhaps best known for his book, uh, I think in, from 1959, called The Crisis of the House Divided. And uh, that is a book in which he sees the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates as being reflective of a debate between uh, actual, you know, sort of philosophical principles uh, represented by Lincoln and uh, the idea that whatever the people want, the people can get. So rule by numbers, rule by force, which is what uh, Harry Jaffa saw uh, Stephen Douglas's point of view as representing. And uh, this actually touched off a long-running debate on the American right about the role of Lincoln, about the place of majoritarianism, and the question of whether someone who steps forward and claims to speak for the philosophical value of equality can be a kind of philosopher king and restructure our entire polity. But I want to turn now to uh, Stephanie Slade and ask her about uh, Michael's comments regarding uh, the very religious uh, nature of uh, you know, our founding. This is something to which, Stephanie, yourself, you, you had alluded to as well. And obviously, you know, things have changed in America since then. It, do we have to recover our uh, sense of our religious and our, you know, sort of not simply individualistic or not simply hedonistic um, impulses as a country? Uh, and if so, how do we do that within the framework of libertarianism or fusionism that you endorse? How can you stop short of using government power in the way that perhaps Michael Anton and Michael Knowles would like to do? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that that is a thing that we have lost. So again, my, my job here is not to say um, that there's no problems with our society today. Everything is hunky-dory and everybody should just, you know, go off to drag queen story hour and, and you know, like, I think I'm also Catholic and um, I, I think that in Catholicism there's this idea of development of doctrine where like revelation happened but we, our understanding of it is unfolding in time. We have to, we have to live, we have to live as, as Michael was saying, like we have to live our lives and we have to explore these ideas and we have to, we have to through the process of exchange and, and um, dialogue and study and prayer and you know, we come to understand what they mean better and how to apply them to the moment that we happen to be living in over time. And I think the ideas underpinning the founding, the same, something sort of similar is true. Um, as a result of that though, I don't think it's enough to just say like, well, um, yeah, they talked about liberty, but they also thought that, you know, they also thought that sodomy should be illegal, and therefore that should be the case as well. You know, QED, case closed, I, I'm right, you're wrong, libertarians. I would say that we have, we are continuing to develop our understanding of how to reconcile these, these two ideas of, of liberty and virtue that can seem to be in tension. Um, Don Devine's recent book on, on fusionism was called The Enduring Tension because the idea was that liberty and virtue can seem to pull against each other. So how can we have them both be these, these two um, you know, non-negotiable pillars of the founding? How can, we, how can we have a society built on both liberty and virtue? Um, and I think that we, it, t it has taken us time through trial and error to understand um, how to do that and to get better at it. And some of the things we've tried have been mistakes. Um, and some of the things we've tried have, have not been mistakes. I think you know the, the fact that we can that we can be full participants in society as Catholics is a suggestion that you know they didn't have it exactly right back in the beginning. Um, on the other hand, some of the many many things that have um, happened in, our, in sort of culturally in the last half a century are things that I lament um, and and that I, I I think were huge mistakes. And I, I often joke about being a single girl in Washington D.C. who is a practicing Catholic. And I can tell you that the sexual revolution has not been great for me in terms of you know trying to get a date around here. Um, <laughs> yes, we have to we have to have we have to we have to uh, live out our values. And when it comes to re um, Reigniting the sort of virtue side of that equation in our in our society, which I believe and in our culture especially is lacking. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, a lot of work to be done. But the the real question, the real sharp divide in my mind, is whether you think that it can be done through passing laws and regulations and essentially using the coercive power of the state to reimpose virtue on society, or whether you think that it has to be done through changing hearts and minds and cultural, you know building cultural institutions and persuasion. And um, there are lots of, you know, the history of America, there have been in the past examples of great religious awakenings. And I think we are long overdue for a great religious awakening, but I just don't think that the state 
is, um, is the sort of correct or um, effect, you know, particularly effective as a means for bringing that about. So we will um, be taking questions from the audience uh, in a few minutes' time, so please do give some thought to any uh, you know, questions you'd like to pose to our panelists. Uh, Michael has uh, points he'd like to bring up, and uh, let me just say, Michael had stressed in his uh, last remarks the importance of practice as a guide to us in politics. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, another name that had come up was uh, M.E. Bradford, Melvin Bradford. And one of his best-known books is called A Better Guide Than Reason, which I think is a phrase taken from John Dickinson. Uh, which precisely is about uh, the idea that practice uh, should be our guide rather than uh, pure theory, even a theory of natural rights. So, Michael, uh, feel free to jump in. Thank you. I would love to defend briefly the coercive power of the government uh, because uh, it, I, I think, what, Stephanie, what you have just alluded to, this distinction between winning hearts and minds and using the strong arm of the state, it, it gets to a, a line that we've heard on the right for many, many years now from the late sainted Andrew Breitbart, which is that politics is downstream of culture, which I think is perfectly right in as far as it goes. But like all slogans, it's also wrong <laughs> because all bumper stickers uh, fail to convey the fullness of reality. Just as we might say politics is downstream of culture and movies and winning hearts and minds and tea with your neighbor is a way to bring about change. You know, all change begins at the dinner table. So too, we might also say that culture is downstream of politics. I look today at Germany to give just one example. East Germany, very atheistic place, 10% religious identification. Uh, West Germany is a relatively religious place, though they have some kooky views, greater than 50% religious identification. Is this because of cultural variations in Bratwurst? I do not think it is. I think it is because of the godless communist government that dominated East Germany for, for the Cold War and I think still has cultural effects. Sometimes it's very difficult to even <laughs> suss out where the culture ends and the politi begin, politics begins or the, where the private sector ends and where the public sector begins. You, you see this notably with, with education. Uh, you know, Dan earlier referred to Buckley's broadside against academic freedom, which he called a hoax and a superstition. And uh, now, today, some people suggest the third grade classroom is some free marketplace of ideas where little Johnny is going to debate the nature of natural rights or something. And that's not the case. The third grade classroom is a coercive environment where children are taught certain facts about the world. Uh, we, we now say that we should never teach students uh, what to think, only how to think. And the problem with this, of course, is that you cannot know how to think unless you know what to think about some basic things. If you don't, if you don't know that 2 plus 2 equals 4, you cannot know how to think about higher uh, mathematics. If you do not know that the American Revolution took place in 1776, you, you can't know how to think about America, which we're trying to do today. So there is coercion involved. And what's interesting about this is that coercive act of education then frees us to be free people and free citizens and gives us liberal education, right? That's the entire point, is to make sense of our freedom. But this, I think, is where the confusion lies, because we're talking about the uh, alleged disagreement between liberty and virtue. And I think that that, that tension would, would seem much less like a tension to the Founding Fathers and to most other statesmen in history, this idea that there's a tension between the liberty to have a drag queen story hour or the virtue of not having a drag queen story hour. I, I just don't think the Founding Fathers would have considered any of those things to be part of true liberty, and, and Lord Acton actually makes, another Catholic, makes this point. I think, I think Acton is still respected by the libertarians. Uh, he makes this point that uh, liberty is not the ability to do whatever you want whenever you want to do it, as many seem to think it is today, but it is the right to do what you ought to do. And, and the way I would bring that down to earth is just to think of the heroin addict who, according to our modern understanding of liberty, is the freest man in the world so long as he has a couple bucks in his pocket and he can score down the street. Well, then he can, he can fulfill his desire and his will to, to get the dope and shoot it up. Isn't he so free? Isn't that a blessing of liberty? No, certainly it's not. Uh, we know that that man is a slave and we know that he's not pursuing his will. Certainly not in the way that St. Paul would have described it, which is that the, th the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I do. Well, was he just bab babbling gibberish? No. He's describing the difference between the appetites, the base passions, and the rational will. The rational will is what mediates between the appetites and the divine will. And this was 
once understood as, as being at the very heart of liberty. This is why when John Adams uses that famous line, the, the Constitution's built for a moral and religious people, he's not a Bible thumper, far from it, he's not superstitious, he's just describing a fact of self-government, that you can't have self-government broadly unless you have self-government uh, personally. And so I, I think even as we were talking earlier about the difficulty of all these labels and trying to parse the precise meaning of all of these principles in the abstract, well, liberty, I guess, is, is really at the heart of that. And if we if we look to the practical um, embodiment of liberty, as the Founding Fathers understood it, but as other great statesmen have understood it, uh, I think we will see that our own abstraction of it is quite wrong, and that liberty is not licentiousness. And as, as the Founding Fathers pleaded, they said, do not abuse liberty to licentiousness, because then not only will you lose virtue, <laughs> but you'll, you'll lose liberty as well. So liberty uh, is often put in uh, contrast, or perhaps even in conflict, with equality. And uh, this has been one of the key sort of uh, tripwires uh, in the conservative battle over the legacy of Abraham Lincoln. So Wilmore Kendall, whose name has come up a few times uh, in this discussion, he was another writer for National Review who uh, dissented from Harry Jaffa's view in The Crisis of the House Divided. Uh, Wilmore Kendall warned that Lincoln's example and Lincoln's rhetoric could be taken out of context of the Civil War and used to justify any kind of expansion of federal power in the name of rights and equality. And this has been the core paleoconservative or traditionalist uh, critique of uh, the emphasis on natural rights and the emphasis on equality in particular in the American tradition. So I thought we'd mix up the order of the panelists. I want to turn to Kevin Gutzman and just say, how do you understand Lincoln's legacy and the uh, use or abuse of equality? I mean, does it seem to you that uh, Lincoln is perhaps, uh, is he a good example or a bad example in the way that uh, he has been adopted and used in politics since his own time? I think many of the issues that have been decided by the central government on the ground of advancing the cause of equality in the last 60 years uh, rightly were not federal issues. And I think obviously Lincoln's example supports a general movement toward having more um, federal initiative uh, with this rationale. So whether you want to argue, whether one wants to argue, well, these people have misunderstood the, uh, the genius in the Latin sense, the, the impulse that they think they're, or they at least have, have purported to be um, advancing. Um, it seems to me that the rhetoric obviously could be expected to lead in that direction. So um, I don't think there had to be uh, insincerity uh, when people uh, invoked Lincoln's example. Um, this gets to part of this gets to an issue that I was thinking about before in terms of uh, the idea that the federal regime has various principles that then must radiate through the entire society, I think is somewhat at odds with the way I understand the American Revolution, which again, I see as having been waged by people who, yes, had in general a common culture, in general a common political uh, society, but also specific manifestations of it that were different. And I think that the really innovative element of our rate of our constitutional system was the attempt at making decentralization permanent. That is the federal principle. So if, for example, people in Massachusetts wanted long after uh, Virginia disestablished religion to keep an established church, they might, after uh, reasonable discussion of the question, have come to the conclusion that that was the, what they wanted to do. And I don't believe that the federal regime was intended to bar their doing that. Similarly, if the Virginians wanted to be making the first officially secular society and, you know, or first officially secular government in world history, well, then I don't believe that this was uh, at odds with what the American Revolution should be understood as having been intended to license them to do. 
Does that make sense? So um, I'm less concerned with having the, the particular principles that I personally favor be followed in all 50 states, Guam, Puerto Rico, and DC, uh, than I am with the idea that these things should be mainly for local determination. And one reason why, I guess, speaking autobiographically, as other people have done already, um, one reason why this model uh, appeals to me is that I'm an army brat. I've lived in 12 states in every region of the country, including that far west time zone where the islands are. And um, I've seen that people sincerely want different government. In different, people in Louisiana and people in Idaho do not want the same kind of government. People in, Mass in Connecticut and people in Texas do not want the same kind of government. The beauty of the American Revolution is that it was intended to allow them on a local basis with their fellow citizens at the local level to decide these questions locally. And what we've come to is, even I've heard a little bit of a hint of it in our discussion here, we've come to have the idea that there are American principles. There are American, I guess, policies. There are American initiatives. And I say, let a thousand flowers bloom. I, I'd rather that we actually picked up this notion that it was supposed to be a decentralized polity instead of one behemoth, which logically, if it's going to be undifferentiated, would be governed more or less from the center. So this gets us to uh, really the heart of a question, and I think uh, Michael Anton will be able to address it very well. What are the limits on an abstract principle like equality, and what, conversely, are the limits on uh, just the public will and the ability of our, you know, sort of localities, or for that matter, uh, you know, the populace at any scale? Um, what are the limits on its ability to say that might makes right, or that numbers make right, or that simple, you know, sort of uh, the existence of a local community means it can do whatever it wants? Well, once you, it seems to me once you ditch any principled ground, common principled ground, you're, you, you, are, you are left with either might makes right or some conception of history, contingent history, changing, evolving standards. And that's really all there is. You only have a handful of fundamental philosophical alternatives. And these philosophical alternatives matter because every, no regime founds itself ostensibly or in its own self-understanding on the basis of nothing. They all have some kind of claim to justice, whether that's divine right, you know, the gods gave us the law, told us this. There, there's a, and there's a limited number of these claims of justice. And that's what the founders were trying to do, I think, in 1776. Um, so again, the, I was going to say, nothing Professor Gutzman said I disagree with until the end when he said he, he, he's skeptical of or even nervous about or even opposed to some kind of broad shared American principle that we would all have in common. At which case I said- That's not quite what I said. I said that the government is going to, Im that the central government is going to impose on the entire polity. Well, if, if not impose, at a minimum it has to uphold. I mean, if we're, we're, a, we're a country- That's a different issue. We're a country that is ostensibly, explicitly based on the equal protection of equal natural rights. You said something earlier too about the, um, uh, introduction into Virginia of a you know, first principle that was then circumscribed by saying, you know, we're only to protect the rights of our citizens. That's absolutely not inconsistent in any way with the way the founders understood the Declaration of Independence. Their view was... No, I meant it was in, inconsistent with the way you people described the Declaration that, but, of but, Independence. But, uh, <laughs> it, it's not. It's not. The, the, their view was, these rights are here by nature and they belong to all men in all times and places. But each individual government is responsible only for securing the rights of the people within it, not the rights of anybody else on the other side of any border. No, but further, the slaves in Virginia were in Virginia. Furthermore, they were they under that government. Furthermore, they recognized the fact that not every people in, all, in, any, in a particular time and place was ready for a government to secure its equal natural rights. They were quite open about this, about um, Spanish, Portuguese, French colonies in Latin America. Like, we can't just bring the Declaration of Independence to Haiti and make Haitians into natural rights loving Americans. Now, the question of, to bring us back to the 1776 Commission, this is a very important point with the, that the commission gets, doesn't get sufficient credit for. The founders knew full well that the principles they stated were incompatible with slavery. Slavery was a fact on the ground. They had no means to solve the fact on the ground immediately. Had they tried to do it, they would have broken the union and it would have led to all of these other follow-on consequences that we don't need to go into now. So they accepted, essentially, the compromise. We will deal with this down the road. They introduced into the Constitution and into the Northwest Ordinance and into other organic laws every ability to restrict slavery that they possibly could. I don't need to list them, but I could if you wanted me to, with the notion that this is, this is going to be a, a, an ongoing problem that will have to be fixed down the road and it is incompat incompatible with our 
with our uh, natural right teaching. The one Jaffa is, is, is I think, his scholarship is strong on this, is that it takes a while for a, the fundamental theoretical alternative to be developed, but it's eventually developed by Calhoun, who says, equality is a lie, therefore equal natural rights are a lie. There are inferior and superior and inferior peoples, and it is just by nature that the superior rule the inferior. I, I would think that most of us, if not 100% of us in this room, would be uncomfortable with that idea, including, this is one of the things that Jeff has sometimes surly debates, might have been, um, taken up a lot of his time and made him, uh, he might, for which he might have had a better use. But they dragged, they drew out the, the, this point that um, in, at least his interlocutors felt uncomfortable defending that position in its theoretical intransigence and tried to back away from it and deflect from it and fuzz up the waters and, and, and change the subject to something else. Whereas the 1776 commission position, I think, is much more clear and I think true. These principles are true. They are incompatible with slavery. As a prudential matter, we don't have the means to solve the slavery issue now, but it's an issue that's going to have to be solved at some point in a way that's consistent with the, with the principles of the founding. I, I, I don't fundamentally see any way around that ex, ex, except in two ways. You either have to take the Calhoun position that, that slavery is not unjust, it's right and it's good, a positive good, or you have to take the position that there really is no natural right and wrong, so it doesn't matter whether this thing goes on existing or not. And the, the founders, Jaffa, Lincoln, and, and last thing on, on, on Jaffa and Lincoln. Jaffa came to agree, so Wilmore Kendall's review of Crisis of the House Divided essentially said, Jaffa's argument in crisis was, the founding, he takes the East Coast view. The founding was low, locky in liberalism, and limited. Lincoln elevates it. He changes the regime. This is why you know, his old East Coast Straussian buddies loved the book, because here comes the heroic statesman taking this, this low but solid thing and elevating it to the high. Um, Kendall, unfortunately, and Kendall points this out in his review in NR, saying, well, what does this mean, that any time there's a crisis, some fresh Lincoln swoops in like a giant eagle and changes the regime into whatever he wants? Jaffa came to agree with that criticism. Unfortunately, Kendall died in, I think, 67. We never got to uh, have this argument out. And re reformulates his argument in not his last book, but his, his last Lincoln book, A New Birth of Freedom. Lincoln didn't transform the regime. Everything that, the, that Lincoln saw in it was already there. He, he, he essentially revitalized and reestablished the regime on the same principles as the founding. As to the specific controversy of the time, this wasn't one where you could let the thousand flowers bloom, right? The cause of the, I mean, we're gonna get into this, I'm sure I'll get a lot of pushback for it, but the fundamental cause of the Civil War was the United States jointly owns a bunch of territory out west. We all own it. The South owns it and the North owns it. We own it together. It is a matter of political controversy what happens in those territories. Will slavery be allowed or will it not be allowed? Yes, no, right? This wasn't one where you could let a thousand flowers bloom. That was the Douglas position, popular sovereignty. Let the people go out there and vote on it. Problem is each side thought that it, the North and the South each thought that they had a fundamental interest in it being either voted up or down and they essentially sent armed gangs into these territories and you get a civil war in Kansas and some of the other territories, right? But that question, are we gonna allow slavery in this jointly owned territory or are we not, can't not be abstracted from the question of is this institution good or is it bad? So right now you're, you're all the way back to theory and first principle. Can't be avoided, can't be solved by letting a thousand flowers bloom. It's unfortunate that it had to be resolved the way it was. Lincoln's position was as long as we can keep it out of the territories, let it live where it exists because he was confident that it eventually would die where it existed. But you know, as Lincoln said in the second inaugural, one side would uh, accept war rather than let the Union perish, and another would make war rather than let it survive. End of the war came. So we're going to go to questions from the audience in just about uh, three minutes here. But uh, I wanted to uh, get to the other side of the panel right fast. Uh, to begin with Michael Knowles, um, you have talked about the importance of using practice as a guide to, uh, uh, you know, for our politics. Um, and yet it seems as if the practice of American politics and the practices of our society have drifted off course uh, over the past, you know, not just 30 years, not just perhaps 60 years, but for quite a long time. When did this uh, sort of drift off course begin? And uh, what caused it? Why, why did our practices go from being virtuous to being conducive to vice? Well, there were many people I'd like to blame. I'd like to blame the uh, second wave feminists. Before that, I'd like to blame the new left. Before that, I would like to blame uh, 
uh, the critical theorists say. Before that, I would like to blame, oh, I don't know, Martin Luther. Before that, I would like to blame, uh, I guess I could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, which is when this problem really began. And the serpent told Eve, ye shall be as gods. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, and I, I, I'm only half joking. I mean, you know, you really could trace it all the way back. But, but there was this shift that happened in the 20th century, there's no question. And, and the shift really does, uh, to shift our focus for a moment from the Civil War to this broader question of the open society and, and the kind of na na fundamental nature of the American regime and when it changes. Th this question of the open society was a big problem uh, because you, you had the left pull a fast one, I think, in the middle of the 20th century. I think that the seeds of what we call now wokeness or political correctness or whatever, I think they were sown in the 20s and 30s, and I think they really flowered in, in the uh, 1960s. And I think the second wave feminists did a bang up job on this in the 70s when they unsettled everything and said that the personal is political. I think they were right. I mean, they were obviously right when, when they would hold their, their, what I refer to as wine and cheese soirees with an H after the W. The New York radical women's groups in New York would invite perfectly happy bourgeois housewives to show up to their little gatherings. And the happy housewives would leave furious at their state in the world. They had had their consciousness raised to recognize their own terrible oppression because they had to do the dishes or something. And, uh, and what they did very successfully by opening up everything from who does the dishes to who you know, watches the kids, when they, when they opened up everything to political scrutiny, that they unsettled all of the standards. And so today, the sneakers you wear are a political matter, and the chicken sandwich that you eat is a political matter. And I know that some conservatives want to return to the largely imagined era, you know, largely fantastical era where we, you know, Tip O'Neill would get a drink with Reagan at 6 p.m., which I think happened like once and they hated each other. Uh, but, but, you know, there was a period where we could all agree a little bit more, and, but, but the standards were unsettled, and I think that the only way out is through. I think we're going to have to win those political battles and actually settle things, and that's going to involve, you know, a political organization. It won't just be winning hearts and minds, but it'll, it'll actually involve some sort of lobbying. Uh, Bill Buckley had this debate uh, in 1966 on Firing Line with uh, Leo Churn. And uh, the question was, <laughs> I mentioned that I'm a McCarthyite because of Dan. The question was McCarthyism, past, present, and future. And I think this was horrifying to people who did not think McCarthyism had a future. Uh, and, and this was 12 years, no, I'm sorry, 14 years after Buckley wrote his defense of Joe McCarthy, McCarthy and his enemies. And, uh, in the debate, Leo Chern said, Bill, the one thing that we have to acknowledge is something that's so central to everything we hold dear is the open society. It's the name of uh, George Soros's foundation, by the way, just to give you a sense of where this idea comes from. And uh, he says, the open society is what matters to us. And Buckley said, no, no, I, I do not think the society should be any more open. I think it ought to be a lot more closed. I am, and then he used this very Buckley-esque phrase, he said, I am an epistemological optimist, by which I mean, I think we can know things. I think certain matters can be settled. I'm not advocating throwing Nazis and communists into prison, but I'm not saying we ought to keep them out either. That, that we actually not only can settle certain things and know certain things, but that we must. Inevitably, society is going to do that. And I think the, the fast one you saw pulled by the left in the middle of the 20th century is this idea that we need to, you know, the free speech movement at Berkeley. Now Berkeley is probably the most hostile campus to free speech in the country. But the free speech movement sprung up there. Why? Because the libs at Berkeley believed that we ought to say anything that we want? No, it's because they wanted to say what they wanted to say, which was being suppressed. And now they're suppressing what we want to say and settling standards and taboos, which are inevitable on their own grounds. Uh, so I think it, it's a, not only am I making the prescriptive statement that we should not have an op uh, open society, but I'm making the descriptive statement that we cannot. Society necessarily entails limits. It always has, it always will. That has certainly been true even in the United States of America, especially here actually at various points. Canc all cultures cancel. In the 50s, you'd be canceled for being a communist. Today, you will be canceled for not being a communist. And frankly, I think the first way was better. <laughs>
This, uh, again, is uh, something that conservatives have been thinking about since the beginning of the post-war uh, movement. And uh, you alluded to Bill Buckley's uh, view of the open society, his very critical view of it. And it seems to me that actually uh, there's a good chance that derives from Wilmore Kendall. Kendall was one of Buckley's professors at Yale. Uh, and uh, Wilmore Kendall confronted this idea that Karl Popper had presented. Uh, Popper's book is known as The Open Society and Its Enemies. And uh, Wilmore Kendall said no. In fact, uh, just as Michael Knowles has spelled out, uh, that any society is going to have its, its public orthodoxies. And there are going to be certain things that a society will just will not allow to be questioned. Uh, Kendall thought this was right, good, necessary if you're going to have any kind of political order. And that uh, the question was then, are you going to choose you know, good things or bad things to have as your public orthodoxy. So this is something that's been hotly debated uh, on the American right, uh, going back to the days of Bill Buckley and, and Wilmore Kendall. I want to turn to Stephanie, though, and just ask, um, do you see some rays of hope uh, on the right? Because I know you have you know, reservations about the direction that uh, the American right is moving in right now. Uh, you see you know, a kind of infiltration of some of the ideas of Carl Schmitt, or perhaps you know, uh, at, a, at a less uh, frightening level, uh, simply a drift towards the use of active government power in ways that uh, you object to. Um, are there signs that um, you know, there may be parts of the con uh, conservative movement or parts of you know, the non-left, however one wants to describe it, which do recognize uh, you know, the, the need for the understanding of liberty that you have and that would like to promote and extend it? Well, I certainly think it's an open debate right now. I mean, this is a live, this is a live question. And what the future of the American right will look like is entirely up to, I mean, the people who are going to live through it. So I'll be curious to talk to some of the young people who are here today and hear what they have, you know, in order to answer this question. I don't know how optimistic I am, but I, I don't believe that it's settled one way or another. But I would really like to just offer an alternative answer to the question that you gave to Michael, if that's okay. I'll, I'll try to be really quick. Um, there is another at least piece of this story, I believe, which is, and this is an example of um, culture being downstream of politics. So it's not the case that I just think that you have culture and then politics results from it. Um, I think the coercive power of the state can really do a lot of damage to the culture, and in fact has in the last century. And one of the ways it has done that is by centralizing, uh, nationalizing the sense that we are not responsible for each other. And we're not responsible, for, you know, not just we're not responsible for ourselves, but we're not responsible for each other because Washington is responsible for them, for your problems. If you have a problem, talk to the, talk to the government. The government will solve it. So going back to the New Deal and the war on poverty and um, an endless parade of government programs passed with the best of intentions to try to help people, people in need. Um, we eroded the idea that we are responsible for solving the problems in our communities, that we are responsible for each other. Um, and we crowded out the private uh, mechanisms and institutions that would go about trying to solve those problems. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a real thing that has happened over the last century and that we are, so when, we, when you ask like what went wrong with the culture, at least part of the story I think has to be the way that the state made it much more difficult for us to be virtuous and to be good people and to pursue the good life and the good society. So let's take some questions from the audience. We'd like to have uh, you try to stump our panel of experts. We do have microphones here, so please come up. I see that Nigel Ashford has a question, so uh, we'll have him come to the microphone and uh, fire away. Yes, I'm Nigel Ashford with the Institute of Humane Studies at George Mason University. My question is on the 1776 Commission, and it's addressed to anybody on the panel who wants to, to comment. Is it a legitimate role of the federal government to write an official history of the United States? <laughs> well, it wasn't an official history of the United States. I mean, if you read it, it's not very long. It's not an official history of the United States. Whether it is or is not a legitimate role, I will say that every department in the United States government writes their own official histories, including the, the military writes histories of, of its wars. Each service branch writes histories of their parts of the campaign. The State Department writes a diplomatic history of the United States. Even the CIA writes a secret history of intelligence operations of the United States. So, if it isn't legitimate, we have a lot of work to do for pulling out those roots and defunding them and stopping them from doing that. In any event, the 1776 Commission is, is report is not so much a history as a defense of the principles and, and, and to some extent a defense of the history without being a complete history against scurrilous attacks meant to delegitimize the country and to be just perfectly blunt, meant to make the vast majority of American citizens hate their country. Mm -hmm. That's what the 1619 Project was. That's what most, if nearly all university campuses pump out. It was almost completely unopposed uh, in, the, in the broader culture. There are attempts to, 
uh, you know, fight it. You know, Encounter Books publishes some things. Regnery publishes some things. There are some good things out there, but they're drowned out 99 to 1. And I personally don't see any harm in having the imprimatur of the President of the United States and the federal government put out a 60-page report lending their prestige and, 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 and weight to it. It's still a drop in the bucket compared to what we're up against, but every drop counts. Kevin, apart from the uh, substance of the 1776 Commission report, um, do, would you agree with Michael that there is an appropriate place for the federal government to produce such a report? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that I as think, a maybe. I think <laughs> asking private individuals to render their, to tender their opinion about a subject like this was perfectly appropriate. I don't think the federal government ought to pay for it, but that's a different issue. I, Okay, we'll take the next question from Michael Maybach. Yes, thank you. Excellent panel, thank you. Um, I'm attracted to what Stephanie Slade just went through, which is the irony that the more we've centralized our government, the more people say, why aren't we united? <laughs> because we weren't meant to be united. We're communities. We had federalism, states, and localities. So is, uh, is the way forward improved if we try to return to federalism and given uh, the, the fact that the income tax goes to Washington and so much is, has been nationalized by the Supreme Court, for example, abortion, marriage. Is it possible to return to a federalism uh, disaggregation which would allow this country to breathe a different way? You know, uh, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, building on some of, of what Mike has said, which is uh, the, the, the difference between our Constitution and our Constitution, <laughs> the difference between our uppercase C Constitution and our lowercase C Constitution, I think in the past week when some federal agency that many people may never have even heard of, OSHA, is now going to jab an experimental drug into your veins and, you, and they're going to do it through the proxy of your employer uh, you know, at, the, at the request of the President of the United States. I mean, that, that seems pretty <laughs> radically different from what we were taught in Schoolhouse Rock about the bill up on Capitol Hill. Uh, so I, I think it's important for conservatives to recognize the government that we are actually living in, you know, the, the, the regime under, the, the nature of the changed regime that we are actually living in. Uh, and the left has not only transformed that regime, but has, has uh, really manipulated it to great effect. And uh, I think conservatives have all too often buried our heads in the sand and tried to return to a bygone era that if it ever existed in the first place, certainly does not now. Uh, so uh, much as I would answer on this issue of the, um, you know, going back to the time when we could have a drink with Tip O'Neill, uh, I, th I think the only way out is through. And uh, to Stephanie's point, she's absolutely right that the government has uh, in not only failed to encourage virtue for many of the recent decades, but has actively encouraged vice. And I think, uh, the, the reason for that is not merely the procedural madness of trying to you know, do good and avoid evil, but also the substance of what the government has actually pushed. And in many cases, they are actively pushing things that are our vice. They're not just making mistakes, but they're actively corroding the country. And so if we want to return to a, a system of federalism and subsidiarity, which I would strongly uh, recommend and pursue, uh, I don't think we're going to do that by throwing up our hands and saying, you know, we're not... Only the left is going to use the government, but we certainly are not, and we, we are going to remain here pure and dignified. I think we're, we are going to have to wield that power for the good, for justice, and, and to uh, transform the regime back or into something uh, that, that resembles a, a much saner political order. And maybe to add to that and to take in uh, responses from other panelists here, I mean, is there a way in which uh, you know, the federal government's power might be used uh, to promote decentralization? Uh, is it the case that you have to have a horse to beat a horse? Or is it rather the case that we should be completely against almost all expressions of or expansions of federal power uh, simply because it's always going to be the sort of uh, the, the ring of evil from you know the Lord of the Rings and it's always going to corrupt uh, whoever uh, wields it? Um, I think perhaps Stephanie and uh, our other panelists might have some uh, uh, a variety of views on that question. I think it's always the ring of evil. That's my view. And, and you're hopeful that if we were to, uh, to use Grover Norquist's famous phrase, shrink Leviathan to the point where it can be drowned in a bathtub, uh, would that help us to restore you know, the health of our communities simply by forcing them to be more self-reliant, as you had perhaps indicated in your previous remarks? Well, that's certainly one of the many reasons, I think, for wanting a limited federal government, right? Constrained and limited and um, 
if nothing else, people can't just assume, they can't just point to Washington and assume that whatever is being done must be being done. They have the resources and the, no, the knowledge, and so they're doing it, so what could I possibly do um, to help the situation? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's certainly a, a great argument for a limited government. It's not the only one, I don't think. I think Michael Anton also has well, a well, well, First of all, let's understand what we mean by limited government. I mean, a limited government, is, in the founder's understanding, is a government limited in its powers and what it could do. It, it wasn't first and fundamentally about its size. There were aspects in which they thought we had to have, the government had to be large in certain respects because otherwise it couldn't fulfill the duties that it took upon itself. So I, I thought I heard, if I'm wrong, I apologize, I thought I heard in the initial question a kind of presupposition that America, as it was originally intended, was not meant to be one country, but kind of a collection. Now, this was before them. If you, if you go back and you read these debates, the founders were big readers of the classical literature. So they knew the example from the ancient world of so-called defensive leagues, and they contemplated such a government. I mean, this, the states would be sovereign, could have their own separate armies, their own separate currency, their own separate treaty-making powers, and come together in times of need for national defense, and ultimately rejected that on theoretical grounds, tried a sort of halfway house with the Articles of Confederation, and then rejected it on practical grounds. So they did willingly unite the American nation into despite the fact that it, there were separate colonies, there was also a common culture, common language, common religion, read the John Jay in, in Federalist II, and a common struggle to achieve independence that further bound the country together. But then they made an affirmative choice to bind together the country politically. Now the question before us, it seems to me, is did that original choice, let's say from, from seven, this, over the period from 1775 to 1789, inevitably lead to the Leviathan, to what we had now, or did we go off the path somewhere? Because I certainly agree with Professor Gutzman who's, when he said, that for the founders, the federal government should do only the things that only it can do and nothing else. And then those things should be left to the states, which should do only the things that they can do and nothing else. And then down to the county and so on, all the way down to the most local community possible. We don't live in that system today. Is the reason we don't live in it because they got it wrong initially and this was inevitably going to happen or did it get corrupted along the way? Mm -hmm. The answer that I was always taught going back, this is one thing I've never changed my mind on and I still believe, is it was not a mistake from the beginning. It was corrupted along the way mm -hmm. and how and where we get it back is a much more difficult question. I'm not really sure but it, it wasn't supposed to turn out this way and I don't think it was inevitable that it turned out this way. Let's go to the next question. Hello, my name is Weston. Uh, I'm a security and intel student at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I just wanted to bring up, when you start getting into things like insurgency and revolutionary theory and the necessary conditions for war political disorder to occur, um, the future given last year's events look quite grim. Um, but when you have the Constitution and Declaration and even classical liberalism at large are under threat by this new uh, contemporary idea of socialism's solutionism, which is a term coined by an ISI scholar, right? I can't remember his name at the moment. Do you think it's appropriate for the federal government to exercise their monopoly on force um, to preserve the country and those institutions? May I? Go for it. The, um, the Declaration of Independence in two separate places <coughs> cites a right of revolution as a fundamental God-given natural right. So it's grounded in, it's grounded, it's a grant of God and it's also inherent in nature. Two separate places. Uh, it's therefore, as much as one bringing that up, one draws the, if we're gonna use Lords of the Rings analogies, the eye of Sauron upon oneself as being an insurrectionist apt to overthrow the government. <laughs> I will point out, you know, as my colleague Matt Spaulding likes to say, every once in a while I go down to the National Archives to see if the declaration is still there. I was there in September, it's still there. So if you, you, know, if you wanna come after me and try to, feds who are listening, put me in jail for <laughs> citing it, you maybe we should hide the document first and also scrub all evidence of it's from the internet. Um, it becomes a question of prudence. So while you always have this fundamental natural right, the founders themselves in, 17, in 1765, let us say, would have said, we have a fundamental natural right to revolution. If we try to exercise it now, the state will crush us and we'll lose. The crown will crush us and we'll lose. Uh, the crown, whatever it is, whatever the sovereign power is, is never going to recognize itself as illegitimate and say, yeah, you're right. Your rebellion against us is justified by nature. Therefore, we're going to come negotiate with you or we're even going to give you what you want. No, they're always going to use state power to try to roll over you. That's just a fact. So as a prudential matter when contemplating this question, you have to think about the odds. And I want to tell one small anecdote because I think it's interesting. One of Jaffa's, one of, another one of Strauss's students named George Anastopolo, 
uh, was a lawyer in addition to a PhD. Very liberal guy, but Jaffa and he were always friends. Well, when it came time for Anastopolo to try to practice law, um, gets all the way before the Illinois State Bar, and they want to have him sign a, a, a piece of paper that, among other things, requires him to pledge eternal loyalty to the United States, so kind of no matter what, in, in whatever circumstances. And he says, well, I can't sign this because if the Declaration of Independence itself says there's a right of revolution, and you're sort of telling me that I'm forswearing my natural right of revolution, and he thinks he's being clever, and of course he's right, an abstruse point, and maybe they'll be reasonable about it, and the, they refused to uh, embar him, or whatever the term is, took his case all the way to the Supreme Court and lost, five to four. Um, and, you know, the guy had another career, he turned out fine, uh, but it goes to show you how seriously governments take this principle, so just invoking the principle, it might be in the Declaration of Independence, you might be morally justified, you might even be prudentially correct, but whatever government you live under is always going to deny it, so know that going in. Okay. Uh, and flag the language of the Declaration of Independence as violent and Yeah, I saw that. That <laughs> happened, what, a couple of days ago, yeah. Very good. Uh, let's go on to the next question. Dave Durrell with the George Edward Durrell Foundation. <clears throat> I recently took the uh, online Hillsdale class on Constitution 101, and one of the frameworks explored there is that we're living through the second constitutional crisis, the first of which was slavery and the subject of Jaffa's book. Um, <clears throat> the crisis was resolved ultimately by the Civil War. The second crisis would be the crisis of progressivism. And I think we've been talking around that all afternoon. Um, the Federalist solution uh, which was to localize a lot of these decisions uh, was underscored by the enumerated powers uh, in the Constitution. So <clears throat> the Declaration of Independence answered the why question, um, you know, why do we need this new union? And the answer was natural law and because the society had already been in place and there was slavery already in place, uh, that crisis needed to be resolved at some point in the future, and it has been. <clears throat> How do you think this second crisis can be resolved? Uh, will it take a civil war? Uh, I think the founders were clear that um, a government's natural inclination is to aggregate power. And 80% of what's going on in Washington, D.C. is illegal and unconstitutional based on the enumerated powers clause. So I'm curious what you guys think. You know, how, how can we get back to that desired state that de Tocqueville immortalized in Democracy in America um, there's a lot of vitality in a society. Um, the word I learned, you know, as a high school student studying American history was pluralism. That's what de Tocqueville saw and thought was so vital about the American uh, civil society. So um, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Kevin, let me direct that question to you in particular. Um, what would you see as being the antidote to uh, the way in which progressives have put us into at least a cold civil war, as I think Angelo Cotavilla has described it, um, which has the potential, perhaps, somewhere down the line, to become a civil war in a, uh, you know, a, a more hot fashion as well. <sighs> I can't say I'm horribly optimistic. Um, I think that we have a pervasive kind of ignorance of the structure of our government, and not only that, of the uh, responsibilities that were understood by the people who made our government to be incumbent on individual citizens. So I think there is far less active participation by the citizenry now than there has been before in American politics or political life, social um, life, and where one starts to undo that is, is perplexing. I've given it 
a lot of thought and have not come to a conclusion. I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer, really. No, it's a, certainly a very hard question. We are um, almost out of time. We have about 10 minutes left, and we have a couple of questions. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, take the next question, and we'll kind of uh, do a rapid fire uh, response round. So go ahead. Hi, Bob Riley, former ISI youth. Um, I, I knew Mel Bradford very well, and I too was a student of Harry Jaffa, and as ISI Western Director at the time back in the 70s, I'd often put them together and I can attest to the tremendous cordiality and the warm friendship that developed between these two. And I counted Mel as a friend as well, and I would describe to him on occasion the crises in American society and how we were disintegrating. And Mel would say, down in my county, it's all fine. We do what our daddies did. And I'd say, well, Mel, the problem is we can't export your county to the rest of the United States, where there are different daddies and they're doing different things. And it's a necessary for us to articulate at the level of moral principle what is at stake. We're in a war of ideas. Now, if I may just make an observation about the United States government, in which I participated for some 25 years, not continuously, but at times in uh, government agencies whose responsibility it was precisely to articulate, defend, and advance American ideas and institutions. That was our job. So there, a 1776 project is exactly on point. What are those principles? Are they, it's all a contest as to moral legitimacy. Whether we're fighting a war of ideas with the Soviet Union or with uh, Islamist terrorists and so forth. And this fight takes place inside the government all the time. I, in a misbegotten move, went back as VOA director at the end of the Trump administration to discover that there was a full-on broadcast and export of the LGBT agenda. Are those the American ideals and institutions which it was our responsibility by charter to express? And as I'm sure you all know, the US Embassy in Kabul was flying the LGBT flag in June as was the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See. Now, as the VOA director, I was going to address these problems and say, no, that, that is not uh, what we ought to be doing. And the former director attacked me in the Washington Post saying I was a dangerous man and Congress needed to remove me because I was expressing contrary ideas. They, it is, you are ineluctably involved in American public life in a struggle as to the moral legitimacy of what you represent and ultimately of the United States. And we do this, or ought to be doing it in the government, and then as private citizens through great institutions like ISI, of which I was part for many years. Sorry, I went on a little too long. No, thank you very much, Dr. Riley. That is a reminder that our government um, you know, even if we wish to be neutral with respect to some of the powers the government might be wielding, the government itself is not acting in a neutral way these days, and in fact is actively promoting, uh, you know, a set of values that are uh, determined by the progressives. And um, with that, let's go to the next question, and uh, we'll be wrapping up shortly. Hi, Emma Posey of American Moment. So you have J.S. Mills, um, infamously the father of libertarianism, who once laid out the single simple principle that you can't interfere with any other people unless self-preservation, so we shouldn't affect the moral or physical outcomes of others, only care for ourselves. And yet after that, he lays out multiple caveats for that. And then Robert Nisbet comes along afterwards and makes a very incisive point that when Mills is writing, he's referring to people who are formed intellectually and morally as he is and share the same values and just general principles of life. Today in our society, we can't even agree upon the fundamental meaning of life, of gender, of what is freedom, and certainly not what is liberty. And then as the examples have shown throughout today, like multiple, like throughout all of American history, like we've used our policy and government to say what is good and what is bad. 
And yet today, and in the last, I don't know, 50 or 60 years, it seems like conservatives are really uncomfortable with this idea of using government power to not only like negate things, but also promote common visions of good. So on the one hand, I'm curious, has a conservative or political understanding of how to use power shifted? And then how should conservatives now think about the use of power when it comes to our common governance? So let me turn that question first to Stephanie, and then we'll get uh, the rest of our uh, panel involved. Yeah, I almost feel like I should be responding because I, I kind of am representing the old school uh, answer to this question, which is that, you know, I, my perspective hasn't changed. I still think power is dangerous and power corrupts. Um, I think that, it, it, you know, big um, interventionist government isn't okay just because the people I like are running it, you know, or the things they're trying to impose are things that I happen to agree with and would choose voluntarily given the choice. Um, I, I My perspective is the is the old school fusionist, um, conservative libertarian answer to this question, and I feel like the ground is moving underneath me, and so I would love to hear my co-panelists offer why they think that that is um, outdated, and, and I think that's what you really want to hear is from them. I just wish that Stephanie would stop imposing her totalitarian moral view of government upon me, I who merely want to wield the government to uh, advance my vision of the good and, and avoid my vision of evil. Uh, it seems to me, uh, without opening too much of a can of worms, that a lot of these problems that we're debating when it comes to uh, you know, the role of libertarianism in the American right uh, come from what I consider to be the false anthropology on which uh, libertarianism is based, uh, up to and including the concept of self-ownership and the idea that I have a right to do whatever I want with my body, which I think is absurd. I don't think I chose, to, I don't think I made myself, I don't think I chose to come into this world, I hope I don't choose to go out of this world, I think I have obligations to my family and my community and my God, and uh, I think we all have those obligations, I think we can know something about them, I think that we, we in fact possess faculties of reason, although uh, in our political life maybe that doesn't always seem to be the case, I think we do in fact possess moral judgment, and I think that there is an objective reality that we can perceive, and I'm not suggesting that libertarians would disagree with uh, all or even most of those uh, premises, but uh, they have been neglected in public life because of the, the uh, focus, the obsession, you might say, on individual autonomy to do whatever we please at any given point. And so I suppose to return to my, my earlier opening point, uh, I just think that uh, in the real practice of these things, the, uh, the, the politics that focuses primarily on right and entitlement uh, is, is just as a prudential matter, a bad course, and we ought to really focus more on obligation and duty and uh, our, our relationship to, to those with whom we do in fact share a society. So do we have uh, one more question here? Good afternoon, my name is John Richards. I'm a student at Hillsdale Van Andel School. And my question is, with the discussion of principles versus practices and disagreement on vectors from which we should perhaps go about driving or enacting cultural values-based change. What do you see as actionable measures uh, which the conservative movement can rally behind as productive instead of political strategies of the party of no or loudly proclaiming what we are against? Um, how do we instead effectively communicate what liberty and conservative values offer to the community? Thank you for that question. That is a, going to be a good point on which we can wrap up. And I'll ask each of the panelists to give about uh, you know, 20 to 30 seconds of an answer, not necessarily uh, you know, in response to your question of what practically can we do, but at least what piece of positive advice would you give to the audience both here and online, um, either about a practical step or about uh, you know, a place to look for uh, the you know, sort of wise direction of our movement in the future. And we'll, we'll go from right to left and start with Kevin. Well, the National Association of Scholars recently had a couple of other uh, scholars and me evaluate four American history textbooks. And this made me think that what we need are more conservatives on school boards. So if you, even if you aren't the parent of a person who's currently in public school, or if you're in private school, you could be involved in running your private school. But if you're motivated to do so, please run for a local school board. And check out the government texts, the history texts. Three of the four were just propaganda through and through. One of them was well done. So there was a good choice that could be made. 
Uh, I think this is something that everybody is capable to do who's interested in doing it, and there are very few people who are informedly seeking seats on school boards in Maine. There are people who, who are parents of current students, which is a, a good partial motivation for running for the school board, I guess, but that's, that's something anyone can do. Michael? I, I just go back to the Trump 2016 agenda. It's still uh, necessary to implement today. I was going to say viable. I don't know how viable it is given the nature and extent and tenacity of the opposition. And right. let's think back to how little of it, I don't mean this as a criticism of him, precisely because of the opposition, how little of it actually got implemented. But it's still the program that we need today. And if we can't do it at the national level, then we need to be doing it at the state level and at the county level and at the city level. I'd like to see the state start standing up and doing their own you know, immigration initiatives about verification of, you know, requiring verification of employment or things like that and getting into legal right. fights with the federal government when the feds come in and say, this is a, you know, the feds typical response to something like this is, this is a federal responsibility, you're not allowed to do that. And oh, by the way, we're not going to do it either. We just reserve the right, we, we say that we're the only ones that have the right to do it and since we don't want it done, we're gonna ensure that it not get done. That seems to me to be a nice fight for the Republican Party to have with the Biden administration along with many others. So just go back to 2016, read his speeches, read the policy papers. Just, let's just try to implement that wherever and however we can, run on it everywhere and so on. It's still very viable to me. Michael? This might sound a little out of left field, but I think one of the uh, simplest things we could do to regain a, a sane politics is to heavily regulate porn, if not ban it outright. I say this at the risk of sounding like church lady. I'm not even really suggesting it because of the porn itself, though I, I do think the widespread ubiquitous porn is an is a actual problem. A lot of young men write into my show. Uh, you know, and say that's given them addictions and, and has ruined their lives. So I, I think it's a real problem in itself. But the, the reason I would suggest this is, is for the political aspect of it, which is uh, until five minutes ago, no one ever thought that there was some constitutional or natural right to porn. Right. Uh, it was illegal for most of American history. We jailed a pornographer just for obscenity a dozen years ago at the end of the Bush administration. He went to jail for almost four years. Uh, uh, now it is uh, ubiquitous and people will defend it as you know, free speech or something like that. And I just think if we took that very modest step to reinstitute what were broadly popular regulations on this sort of thing, as they did at the end of the Clinton administration, the Communications Decency Act that we all talk about with regard to big tech, the whole point of that act was to regulate porn on the internet, passed with Republican and Democrat support, signed into law by Bill Clinton and gutted by a bunch of idiot judges. Uh, there was a, an even more restrictive law, the Child Online Protection Act, went after not just obscene content, but prurient material, material appealing to the prurient interest. Most people don't even know what that word means anymore. That also had Republican and Democrat support, also gutted by some idiot judge. If, if we could take what I think would be surprisingly popular and common sense and well in keeping with the American political tradition, if we could just remind ourselves that we actually can assert limits on these sorts of things. I, I think that would give conservatives in particular the confidence to, uh, to defend a set of standards without which uh, we will continue to, to lose the culture. And Stephanie? Earlier I mentioned that Frank Meyer's contribution was to think in terms of separate spheres, the governmental sphere and the non-governmental sphere. One of the things I would say is that we need to be very careful about not assuming that the only solution, you know, the, the only way to solve problems is to pass a law, to assume that government will do it. I think it, many of the problems facing our society today are crisis of meaning level problems, you know, religiosity, community breakdown. Um, these are things that are not going to be solved in the governmental sphere by passing a law, treating the law like a magic wand. You're going to have to think creatively about what can we do to solve these problems in that other sphere that that is the correct uh, under this sort of fusionist understanding, the correct sphere um, where virtue is supposed to be the driving force. Um, government is supposed to protect liberty. We are supposed to pursue virtue. And so I think not, um, just not, I, I know that politics is, is interesting and exciting and it's sexy, and I'm a political journalist, so I, I totally get that. Um, but really, I think we, we have tended to seed culture um, and voluntary solutions um, and as I mentioned earlier, part of the reason for that is because of in interference by the state that has crowded out those voluntary solutions, but we should not surrender. We should, we should be aware that that is happening and we should resist it, I think.
I want to thank uh, all of you for coming today on behalf of both Modern Age and uh, ISI. I want to thank all four of our uh, brilliant panelists. Today's discussion has been only a